could you tell I was not uh, remembering that they were walking off and Glenn was doing that? Well, no, that's nice. Fill in the blank quiz. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Almighty. There's a big theological word we use to talk about the almightiness of God. Does anybody know what it is? It starts with an O. Omnipotent, all powerful. The God that created the heavens and the earth, the God that created everything in its order, including you, including myself. This God has such power we can't even fathom. You know, if the only thing that God wanted was for you and I to be in heaven, would we be here right now? If that's the only thing he wanted, wouldn't we already be there? Wouldn't we already be face to face with him? If the only thing that God wanted was for us to be righteous and in heaven with him, we would not be here. So there must be some other reason, some other purpose for our being here, right? Logic would tell us that if we are not there with him now, he must want for us to be doing something. Our first scripture from Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 says, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm. To give you a future with hope. Surely I know the plans that I have for you, Nikki. For you, Jackie. No, I'm not going to call on all of you. <laughs> God has a plan. He has a purpose for you and for me. He has a plan for us. We've been talking about in this series being the body of Christ corporately. Chris has so well pointed out that the body corporate is made up of many individual members, you and I, and billions of others, right? God has a plan for each one of those individual members, you and I, and for the body corporately. He knows what they are. But it's not easy, this bodybuilding stuff. I find it a little surprising that so far to this point we have not actually used the illustration of bodybuilding. But yes, this morning we're going to. <laughs> bodybuilding isn't easy for you, Bonnie, as an individual, or me, Todd, it's not easy for us corporately. We start someplace in hopes to get someplace. Where we start is kind of a weak place. It's something like this. That was not me. Could have been. We start weak and in inept, unable to even fathom that there is a God that would want for us to accomplish something particular or specific, a purpose, a plan. In this place, in this world, on earth, here and now, not just in heaven. So we start in this place and we hope to get someplace more like that, right? <laughs> that was me a couple months, no. <laughs> These are dreams being realized here on my part. No, not at all. But bodybuilding is not easy. It takes effort. There are oftentimes great pains to become looking like that. You might have heard the common phrase in the sports world, uh, no matter what the sport is, and it's not just a sports phrase, but you might have heard this phrase, no pain, no gain, right? So you have this picture here where this guy is just, you can just see the pain on his, on his face as he's grunting and grimacing to try to lift that heavy weight trying to lift the heavy weight. It's not easy. In this series, we have been talking about disciplines and practices that will help us build up the body. And those practices, although on the surface they don't seem like they're that complicated, they don't seem like they're difficult, it's not easy to pray individually when we should, how we should, as often as we should, together, corporately? Do we gather with other believers on Sunday mornings, on other days of the week, to pray? It's not as easy to be welcoming and inviting, as Lynn, Pastor Lynn, talked about. It's not always easy because sometimes our sinful side wants to become 
come out and be selfish, and we don't want to be inviting and welcoming. We want it our way. We want somebody to welcome us. When are they going to come up to me? Why do I have to go up to them? It's not easy to be that. To live generously in all things, in all ways. This is not an easy task to open up sacrificially so that it impacts our lives, so that we feel that pain so that we can gain, so the body can gain. To love worship. To love worship solely and strictly so that God's name will be glorified, not so that we can be satisfied. It's not easy to practice these things. But nobody ever said it was going to be easy. Today we're talking about the pursuit of spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is a process. It's not something that happens overnight. It does take the pain to receive the gains. It does take the effort to get there. I'm reminded of uh, these scriptures that we'll look at that help us to understand that this is a process. The Lord Jesus even tells us that it is a process. Look in Matthew 4.19, it says, And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. He does not say, Follow me, and you will be a fisherman. Follow me, and in that moment, you will become a fisher of people. He says, I will make you. This Greek word that, that makes up the will make is an active future tense. It's active. It's an ongoing thing that in the future will find its, its completion. And then in Revelation 21.5, the Lord says, And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Again, this Greek word that makes up the word making, it's the same form of the, it's the same word that was in the Matthew text, but instead of being a future active, it's a present active, am making, but it's presently actively making. It's an ongoing process. The Lord Jesus tells us that forming your spirit is an ongoing process. I like to think about spiritual formation actually as spiritual reformation. The reality is that God has already formed us. He has already created us. In Genesis 1, we learned that he created humans and he created them to be not good, but very good. God formed us very well. But sin has crept into our reality and has deformed us. So that our pursuit of spiritual formation is the pursuit of our spiritual reforming to get back to where we once were so that we can make those gains in our spirit. Many of you probably don't know that for um, most of my formative growing up years, the sport that I predominantly played was soccer. I played soccer f for a great number of years, and then I coached soccer, and I was a soccer referee for a number of years as well. I coached all age groups, so from the little itty-bitties up through high school varsity boys. And um, in middle school, I, I coached the middle school team. It was a co-ed team, and there was this boy named Brandon Johnson. Oh, Lord, help Brandon Johnson. <laughs> Interestingly, when I was a fourth grade teacher, he was one of my first students. And then a few years later, I had him again in middle school as he walked on to the soccer field. And I sort of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, Brandon, hey, you're here. All right. God love Brandon. He was a little bit of an awkward fella. Very hyper. Hardly could focus. Not what you would consider athletic. And it showed. <laughs> he would look at that ball, and he'd have every intention of hitting that with his foot, but he would swing and miss and fall down on his rear end. And it was just awful. He was kind of the soccer equivalent of that scrawny kid in the bodybuilding picture. I took Brandon aside after a few practices, and I... We had a good, honest talk. Brandon, you got a long way to go, don't you? I really appreciate you being out here. You're a good guy, courageous. 
What do you want to have happen? He says, I want to get better, coach. I said, okay, it's going to take a lot of work. You're going to have to be at every single practice. You're going to have to put forth 100% when you are at practice. You're going to have to really try hard. And it's not going to be easy. And you're going to probably fail more times than you succeed. He said, okay, coach. I'm in. And little by little, day by day, I swear, by the end of that season, he was not whiffing any longer. He did spend some time on the ground, but that's because people were pushing him. <laughs> but he got better. He made those gains. Because he and I sat down and we talked about where he was starting and where he wanted to go. We had this conversation. He listened to me, somebody that could be honest with him about who he really was at the beginning, where he was, in a loving, in a gentle way, but in a realistic way. We didn't play games. I didn't say, oh, Brandon, you're better than that. I didn't put this false sense of who he was and identity into him. But we talked honestly about where he could be and how he needed to get there. Building up our, our spirit is sort of that way. We need to know who we are. Honestly, where are we in all of those disciplines we talked about this morning? Praying being hospitable and welcoming and inviting to other people, even when they're different than us, living generously in all things with our money and our time and our talent till the very last breath that we take. We have to know who we are. And the only way to know who we are truly, our true self, is to know God. The more we know God, the more he reveals to us who we are. One of the best scriptures that we have that really highlights this is Psalm 139. Let's read it together now. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind, and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil, do I not hate those who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred, and I count them my enemies. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This psalm has so much in it. That was very, very nice job, by the way. The psalm has so much in it, but it begins with the reality that God has already known us and searched us. He's searched us already. It's done. He therefore knows us. And then so poetically, the psalmist explains how it is possible that he could know us so intimately. It's because he formed us, knit us together. The psalmist then goes into this whole hatred thing, right? This dark side, sort of realizing the fact, the reality that sin has gotten into us. And we have a dark side. We can hate with the best of them. When we're called to love, yet we can hate. And then this invitation at the end, the psalmist says, again, search me and know me. It's, it's almost this invitation for God to help the psalmist to know who he is. You search me and know me. Tell me. Help me understand who I am. Because it's when I understand who I am through you, I can then understand what I need to do to get from the scrawny kid to the bodybuilder. The more I gain, the more the body gains. Because the body is only as efficient, effective, as good as its weakest links. You probably see this in the news. How Christians get such a bad rap in the media, don't we? Because some fanatic is over somewhere doing something that's so unbiblical and not Christ-like. And all of us get judged. The whole body is unloving. The whole body is hypocritical. Every one of us, as the singular body of Christ, because of a member that's why it's so important that you go forth in the practices on your own and as a part of the body. That's what spiritual reformation or formation is. It's the process of practicing these disciplines day in and day out so that we can move from point A to point B, spiritually speaking. It's showing up at practice, ready with your cleats on, your shin guards, and your attitude is positive so that you can, you can work hard and make those gains so that the greater body that is global, that is worldwide, that is universal in Jesus Christ can accomplish the purposes and the plans that he has for it, for you, and for the body of Christ. So we get up in the morning, and we turn our eyes, we lift them up to the Lord where we get our help. Because you cannot face this day even hoping to show up for practice if it's not for the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. None of this happens on our own. It all happens because we, we turn to God and the power of his Holy Spirit. This world is a dark place it is fighting against you. This world is going to be that thing that gives your mom the flat tire while you're on the way to soccer practice. And say, no, you will not show up today. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's there that has this stranger pull up behind you and say, do you need help? Can I get you on your way to where you need to go? I have this little illustration I want to share with you this morning as we talk about how the world and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. This bowl here is us. You can see that we're not really fully clear. We're kind of tainted a little bit. The reality is we don't like to think about this, as, but this is how we're born. We don't like to look at little infants and little babies is having sin within them, but they do. It's, it's what the Bible teaches us. None are good, not even those one-day-olds. And we can take the darkness of this world that is so free. This is free. The world will give this to you. 
the darkness, the sin. We add, it starts to darken us a little more. We add, we think, oh, just this once, I'll skip, I won't give, I'll think of myself, just a little at a time, day after day, year after year, decade after decade, and pretty soon, the world has darkened us, and in this form, it is very difficult for us to make those gains. Because when we are tainted with darkness and sin, we do not want to practice praying. We do not want to open the Bible. We want to say, I would rather go do something else. I would rather go do something else. Maybe we don't use those words, but in effect, that's what we're saying. But by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ... When we do practice, when we do work on building up our body, our spiritual body, and our physical body, and the body of Christ, and we bring in a little bit at a time the benefits of the Holy Spirit, the power that he has through prayer, through scripture, through living a loving life and generous, you can see that little by little, a process takes place that cleans and purifies us. And there is no more darkness in us. This is what Christ does for us on the cross, and he offers us every single day through the power of his spirit that abides in us. And then when we are filled with the goodness of God, when we have prayed and have read his word and have communed with him and joined with him, when we have loved and lived generously, when we have been inviting and welcoming to others, then we can go to our friends, our neighbors, strangers, people in the community who are also filled with the darkness of this world. And out of what the Lord has given to us that we have invited in through our practices of building the body, little by little, day by day, we can have an impact. This, my friends, is what Jeremiah 29.11 is all about. This is for what God has called us to be. This is the plan. This is is the purpose. Now, how you do it, where you do it, to whom you do it, looks different than for me and for each other. But we are called to lead people to Christ. Jesus says, go therefore to all the nations, baptizing and teaching all that I have commanded you. Lead them to me, for in me and in me alone can people find true life. And when we practice the disciplines of the church, when we practice them on our own, and when we practice them together, we are ourselves made stronger. And then with the help of the Holy Spirit in us, working through us, we can help others and lead them to Christ. This is what the pursuit of spiritual formation is all about. It's putting in the work. It's putting in the effort, together, collaborating with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis to build yourself up so that we corporately can be built up as the body of Christ, so that we can fulfill the plan that God has for us in the here and the now, which is to help people in the name of Jesus Christ. We need each other to do that. I can't do it by myself. You can't do it by yourself. We do it together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.